doing it live on KSS YouTube channel and most of groups in India are organizing some webinars and program functions on International Yoga Day. So who they are missing this lecture series will be able to watch it on KSS YouTube channel. So I think we should start now. Namaste to everyone. I am Dr. Alok Kumar Divedi from Kuruom School of Advanced Sciences, School of Indic Studies, Institute of Advanced Sciences. And we are organizing the KSAS talk, which is monthly lecture series. Today's lecture series title is Artificial Intelligence, Machine Learning and Deep Learning. We have very eminent speaker today. He is Dr. Bharatin Dara, he is Professor of Business Analytics in the Carl Lawton College of Business at UMass Dartmouth. He received a PhD in Industrial Engineering from Wayne State University, Detroit. His two master's degree include specialization in quality, reliability, and OR from Indian State Institute, India. His current research interest include machine learning and deep learning applications. His YouTube channel is watched over in over two to five countries in all over the world. So it's our privilege to have you, sir, here. And for formal welcome, I would like to invite Dr. Rajkumar, the pro Associate Professor in Institute of Advanced Sciences and the Director of Kuruom School of Advanced Sciences. I would like to invite him for the formal welcome of Dr. Bhartendra Rai. Over to you, sir. Hi, Dr. Rai. Uh, it's very my great pleasure to invite Dr. Bhartinder Rai. I am known to him since my PhD days, and I, I saw he is a great achiever, and he did a lot of good work in the Charlton College of Business. Uh, so, Dr. Rai, it's uh, over to you, Dr. Rai. I'm welcoming you for this talk. Uh, thanks. Uh... Uh... Will I be able to share my screen? Hello, please make him host. So, you, are uh, able, you are able to share. Okay. This. And uh, should I assume it's the talk is for about 40 minutes? 45? Yeah. Something yeah, 35 like to 40 minutes and then five to 10 minutes question answer. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, opportunity to give a talk. So the topic, as you know, is AI, machine learning and deep learning applications and uh, opportunities based on my experience. My name is Bharatendra Rai from Charton College of Business, University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. Uh, same place where Dr. Balram Singh also like he was in the I think chemistry department. So I've been uh, with Charton College of Business uh, since 2006. So it has been a lot of years. And uh, before that, I used to work at Ford Motor Company. Uh, here I'm with uh, one of the managers of uh, powertrain and I was there for about six years while doing PhD because Ford was supporting my PhD work or funding, I would say, uh, my PhD work. And after coming to Charton College of Business, uh, I have been uh, involved with uh, uh, obviously a uh, lot of research. Uh, here I am with the professors uh, at a hospital where we were conducting some programs and then uh, I teach students, I teach uh, business analytics and data mining to the students. Uh, my PhD student, uh, she graduated uh, two years back. In uh, Her PhD was in industrial engineering, but the focus was basically on applying machine learning, deep learning, or AI approaches to healthcare data. So her PhD is uh, in healthcare analytics. And right now she is working at MathWorks. So that's the company that, uh, that has MATLAB as one of their products. 
And uh, this is a senior vice president from uh, IBM who visited us and uh, we also do some work with them. So quick outline, I will present some case studies. And talk about uh, big data because all these methods require a lot of data. And then some examples from business and anybody interested in like what kind of jobs exist nowadays. So very briefly, we'll go over that. So this is a very popular Venn diagram or where you see AI as the bigger circle. I'm sure like uh, most of you must have seen this. Almost every, every book on analytics or AI or machine learning has this diagram. And uh, AI basically tries to uh, mimic humans. So we try to create methods that try to mimic uh, how human beings work, how they answer questions. Uh, so various aspects of how humans work. And within that, there is a subcategory, which is a machine learning where we apply a lot of machine learning methods. There are a lot of uh, popular methods there. And within that, uh, there is a smaller branch uh, which focuses on deep learning. So uh, deep learning mainly makes use of deep neural networks. By deep, it means like a lot of layers within the neural networks and it has a lot of parameters. There is, a, uh, there is a case study that was done, I think in 2012, long back, uh, more than 10 years back. And what they reported at that time, Facebook was very hot. Uh, still a lot of people use it. So somebody collected data and what they found was, if you have data on 68 Facebook likes, you can predict skin color of a person with 95% accuracy. So you can develop those kind of models and you could be 95% right. You could, uh, you could predict sexual orientations and political affiliations with 88% accuracy with that type of data. If you have data on 10 likes, you can evaluate person better than interviewing coworker. So nowadays, uh, many people actually, when they are hiring uh, or screening candidates, sometimes they go on social media and look at various aspects of what kind of posts uh, these people make and things like that. So it can, uh, it can evaluate person better than interviewing a coworker. 70 likes, with that data, you can outperform friends who thought they knew about him or her. With 150 likes, you can evaluate a person better than their parents. With 300 likes, you can uncover things that their partner did not know, like uh, wife did not know something about husband, husband did not know something about wife. But with the, that kind of Facebook data, you can predict that with great accuracy. Uh, more than 300 likes, if you have that kind of data, you can even outperform person, person themselves, what they know about them. So how I will react in certain situation when I see an ad or when I dri I'm driving, like looking at something, how I will react to something uh, that algorithm can even uh, predict better than myself. So with these uh, smartphones, obviously, smartphones, computers, all the technology. So it has created like a, a sort of questionnaire every time like we are doing anything on that, that data gets collected and you may know it, you may not know it. Nobody reads uh, when you accept uh, some terms and conditions. So it uh, basically generates lots of data. If you look at uh, Google Trends, that's a website one of the websites from Google where you can see how the how some terms are trending based on searches that people make. 
So you can see that uh, the blue one is machine learning and red one is deep learning. So it has been towards the peak. So 100, 100 means like the maximum number of searches and then related to that, how many searches people have been doing. Obviously, you'll see some dips, for example, uh, around New Year. So, you know, like people are not searching on Google. They are like busy celebrating, uh, welcoming New Year. And similarly, some holidays, you'll see some dips there. And also where it is popular, almost like everywhere in the world. So whether it is machine learning or deep learning, uh, China actually is quite active. Uh, in fact, uh, I would say in AI, they have the lead over any other country in the world. So some uh, simple examples that anybody can understand. So this is a work uh, that I did uh, while I was doing PhD in industrial engineering at Wayne State University. So we had a lab and in that lab, uh, we were trying to research a few things. And one of the problems in manufacturing is there is a drill bit that is used for drilling holes. And it is used uh, in so many different uh, situations. In fact, 80% of the cutting operations involve some kind of drilling. And uh, if you think of like a big board on which thousands of holes are to be drilled, that board may be very expensive. It could be metallic or whatever it is made up of. And if uh, you have successfully drilled 900 holes, and next in the next one, if the drill bit breaks, the whole piece gets damaged. You cannot use it. So drill bit is actually inexpensive. It's very cheap, but the damage it can do is very big. So one of the problems, one of the solutions is after every uh, few holes people drill, you stop the machine, take out the drill bit and find out like how much wear has taken, taken place. So measure that wear and if it is okay, put it back and then keep running for a few more holes and then again stop the machine, again take it out. But that solution is very intrusive because production managers, uh, they will not like that kind of solution. Uh, they, uh, they will suffer like big hits to productivity. So the idea of uh, these kind of research is to find a way where you can take actions in a non-intrusive way. You don't have to stop the process and still you are able to predict that the drill bit is going to break and then you replace before it breaks. So that's the idea behind uh, predicting drill bit breakage using degradation signals. So we set up like uh, the machines in such a way that we can capture thrust force while the drilling happens and also the torque. And, and uh, we had a mechanism by which we can like vary like how much data you want. Like within a second, you can get like 100 data points. So out of that, we convert uh, that data point, which is like a lot of data, like per hole, you can have thousands of data points. So we convert that into some features, like very simple, like what is the maximum value of the thrust force for that particular hole or that particular interval? what is the average variability and so on. And same thing for torque. So we generated like 20 different uh, features out of it and then started applying some machine learning methods to see if we can predict it with a greater accuracy. So if you look at like, this is a simple decision tree and the variable that comes at the top is O. So O is coefficient of variation related to torque. So that's the variable that has maximum impact on drill bit breakage, followed by L, which is uh, maximum torque, and then Q. So most of the variables are related to torque. Obviously we can make a 
make this tree deeper and figure out like which other variables are playing how much role. But if you look at the terminal nodes, the end end uh, box or the triangle, sorry, not the triangle, but the rectangle. So it has three numbers, which gives you uh, some kind of signal. So one of them is, uh, one of them you can think of like green. So first one is green and then yellow and then red. So the way it was implemented was through like signals, although it may do a lot of machine learning models and then have a lot of data, but so somebody who is operating the machine, they need a very clear cut signal. So when they see a red light, that means stop the machine immediately or probably even that can be automated. So when we reach uh, this terminal node or last node, you can see the first one green probability is almost one. So this is a rounded number. It may not be exactly one, but it may be 0 0.999 something. So that means uh, there's no need to stop the machine. If uh, you are in this terminal node, just carry on. The, the danger of like a drill bit breaking and damaging the whole thing is very low. But if you look at uh, this terminal node, the highest probability is for red or the drill bit is about to break. So immediately machine should be stopped. So, so here you can see the orange or the middle is the highest one. So it may not like break immediately, but there is a danger. There is some percentage percentage chance. So it uh, one can decide based on the kind of uh, material being drilled. If it is uh, too expensive, you don't want to take any risk. You want to stop here and replace that inexpensive uh, drill bit. So this is one example of a machine learning method, which uh, usually like a very easy to understand and see visually like what's happening. Because most of the machine learning methods or deep learning method, one of the critique is that it is like a black box. Nobody knows what is going on, but here at least visually you can see, but we also know that it suffers uh, from uh, some problems uh, accuracy levels are not as great as you get with like uh, maybe random forest or some other methods. Uh, this is another application where we applied a machine learning method called random forest classification. And uh, this paper was published in one of the healthcare journals uh, in 2019, International Journal of Big Data and Analytics in Healthcare. And uh, this was part of uh, my PhD student's uh, thesis. So the key thing is uh, detection of freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's Parkinson disease uh, is a big problem like in old age. And the freezing of gait means that somebody is walking and suddenly if that happens, they may fall down. They may know, they, uh, before they realize, uh, they may fall down and somebody who is like, let's say 80, 85, 90, falling down can, uh, can be very disastrous. The problem is that there's no medicine for this. There's no cure. At least as of today, uh, you cannot do anything about it. So the idea is, idea of generating a model is to be able to make a prediction before that event happens. So if you can monitor the patient's movements and if you can predict it even like one or two seconds before and there could be some buzzer or some, some alert where that person is made to sit down and avoid a fall. So that is always good. So here we applied a, a random forest and the way the data is collected uh, you have like, we want to capture data on ankle acceleration. And within that, there are three different uh, data points that it generates. And then uh, there is a sensor that is tied to upper leg or thigh to collect uh, three different data sets. And then at a trunk or like hips. And then you have like uh, three data points. So totally like uh, nine data points. And the final response is whether 
freezing of grade occurred or it did not occur. And this is labeled by a specialist, like, so they say whether it has, it is there or not. So this is a typical uh, like assessment of a model. This is a, this is called like confusion matrix, how confused the model is. And if actually it is one, like no freezing and the predicted, predict, pre predicted class or prediction is also one, that's a correct classification. So 11,924 instances of that. Similarly, if freezing of gate occurs, which is a class two, and prediction also is two then, that also is a correct prediction. So 796 occurrences of that. But there are some misclassifications also. 44 times, actually, freezing of gate happened, but this model did not predict correctly. So that's class one. So that is a misclassification. Similarly, 13 times, actually it was one, no freezing of gate, but the model, machine learning model says that actually there is a freezing of gate. So out of these two, definitely like this is, uh, this is bad because you don't want your model to predict something. And if that person has freezing of gate and falls down, so that is more dangerous. But this is less dangerous. This is just uh, being like uh, more cautious. So one of these categories, you can say like uh, crying wolf when it is not there. And then uh, a wolf is there and then you don't cry. That's obviously more dangerous. So this is a, uh, another application. Uh, this is in healthcare. Another machine learning method. Uh, so those of you like uh, who have studied uh, this field, obviously, you know, like there are two categories of uh, machine learning method. One is uh, supervisory uh, and uh, unsupervised and supervised because the previous two, you have a response variable, but association rules are applied where there's no response variable. So you have data and then you try to extract some patterns. So it's very common, like if you go on Amazon, and search for a book. Not only it will bring all the details about the book, but it will also say that customers who bought this item also bought something else. So this is also called the market basket analysis, like people who go to stores and uh, uh, those retailers, they analyze the, the basket and try to understand what are the things that are bought together? So there's a very popular example where uh, somebody did a study at Walmart and they found that whenever somebody buys uh, huggies, diapers, the chances of that person buying beer is very high. Probability is quite high. So those two things go together. So one thing, uh, one thing it's true for retailers is that they are not worried about why somebody is doing that, why somebody buying Huggy also buys beer. There could be like thousands of reasons, but at least they can use that information and maybe make the layout of the store in certain way so that the customer can benefit. Maybe keep them together or keep them like uh, uh, two different corners of the store so that the, the person has to walk across and buy something else. So I remember we applied this at Ford, where uh, you know, like engine has uh, more than seven thousand parts, and uh, when some parts fail, sometimes the probability of uh, another part is uh, quite high. So we did this market basket analysis or association rules analysis, and uh, we found that uh, uh, it was like engine starting problem and one of the fuel injectors was causing that problem. And whenever that was replaced, the truck was coming back for repair. And uh, through the analysis we found like actually in those cases where that, that item is replaced along with a very inexpensive item, when those two are re uh, replaced together, drivers don't come back for the repair. The problem, problem is solved. So it was applied, uh, uh, in an automobile kind of situation also. 
but Amazon was able to increase uh, their sales or revenue by like 40% just by adding this feature uh, where they are recommending other books, like what other customers are doing with this. So this is a company that started in 1995. Uh, and that time Jeff Bezos, he came out with this new model, which like uh, people thought he's crazy, uh, selling items from a website and the internet was just uh, becoming popular at that time. And when he created uh, this Amazon website, uh, initially he was only selling books. And uh, on that website, even there was no like way of sorting them. You could not search or sort. You have to go like one by one and find the book you are interested in and then place an order. So obviously Amazon has come a long way from 95. They made their first actually one penny per share, first profit in 2001. And today is, uh, I think, uh, more than a trillion dollar market cap company. And the amount of machine learning, deep learning algorithms they employ to improve their website and uh, studying like uh, at any time, a point in time, they are doing thousands of testing on how the screen should look, uh, what will be the colors, the font size, and many other things. Uh, so that's something they do all the time. Another uh, application of machine learning, again, non-supervised learning, is uh, text mining. So text, uh, text data is a form of unstructured data, which is majority of the data that we have, like pictures, audio, video. So text data is a big, uh, huge data set. And uh, one of the things about uh, text mining is that you could you can uh, you can do like some kind of sentiment analysis. If you look at Twitter, and uh, let's say a company like Apple, they announce earnings, or they come out with a new product like iPhone or some new Mac. So a lot of people are writing on social media. So a lot of text data is generated. And for a company like, big company like Apple or Amazon, so they don't have like time to go through each and every tweet or each and every social media post and understand like what customers are thinking for their new product or new design. Uh, but that's where like machine learning methods are very useful. So this is an example uh, where I have classified uh, sentiments uh, hidden in the tweets in uh, different categories, like how many people are angry about some feature being removed, uh, how many people are positive or uh, they anticipate good things to come, uh, they fear something or joy, sadness, surprise, so standards, standard uh, aspects of sentiments sentiment analysis. So this is uh, very common with text mining. Uh, another example or application is uh, when presidential debates happen in US, you see there are two candidates and around that there's a lot of buzz on social media, a lot of posts. So sometimes uh, this analysis can help them in adjusting their strategies when they co go for the next debate. Or they can like compare their performance before the debate and after the debate and see what whatever strategy they are using is working or not. Is it converting uh, social media sentiments into positivity or negativity? Uh, another example is uh, cluster an analysis. So I remember uh, uh, this is like about 10 years back. Uh, one of my colleagues, she's from China and she came to my office and she said, we are working on a research. So uh, a researcher in China and uh, she has a lot of like smartphone uh, app related data that she's trying to analyze. And uh, she wanted my help uh, with applying like 
some machine learning method to that data because the data was quite big. But the problem was that uh, researcher in China, she did not understand uh, English. So she would send emails in Chinese and my Chinese uh, colleague, so she will, uh, she will convert that email into English and then send it to me. And then I will make some comments or give some suggestion. And then again, it will go to her. She will convert to Chinese and then it goes there. And so it was taking a lot of time. So I asked uh, my colleague, like, uh, why don't you ask her to send me some data so that I can analyze on my computer or laptop and when I get some ideas, uh, concrete ideas, I can suggest this is what we can do instead of like exploring and it's taking a lot of time. So we came to know that the data was like a, a huge data set, like I think 150 gigabytes or something. So obviously it could not be sent by via email. So I applied for a grant, uh, travel grant to China in the summer and uh, I went to China, I stayed there for two weeks. And there were some students and that, that faculty researcher. So we worked together and completed the paper. So sometimes like working with a lot of data becomes uh, difficult uh, separate, uh, if you're separated by distance and also like language barrier. So here, this is just one of the charts from that paper. It was about predicting users app usage based on clustering analysis of smartphone data. And uh, this particular cluster diagram is for how often a smartphone user is playing game or using a game app. So we categorize like uh, different apps on the smartphone in different categories. So there are some game related apps, social med media related apps, travel related apps, and so on. So this was related to games. And you could see that uh, there are some users who, are, uh, who have very low usage. They don't play that many games on smartphone. But uh, some people, you can see this is like red, totally red, so almost like addict. And then also there are people who uh, switch from one, like you may find somebody who is here, suddenly like uh, goes to cluster number two because of whatever, maybe something special or maybe very busy time during their work. So this was a cluster analysis application that we did. Now coming to deep learning, where we employ a lot of uh, uh, neural networks. So one of the popular methods is called autoencoders. And uh, the example that I've given here, so it takes the data and using auto encoders, uh, it can do certain things. So, uh, so this is from one of my books uh, uh, that I wrote uh, recently on deep learning. And the idea here is that these are digits, like if you are driving a car, for example, and uh, there, are, uh, there are cameras that read your number plate, and then you get billed for the toll, whatever fee it is. But uh, there are days when it is, uh, it's not very clear. It's a uh, lot of rain is there, there may be hail, maybe snow, and the visibility quite, uh, could be very poor. So we took uh, some num handwritten numbers and uh, inserted noise into it so that it doesn't look like seven, like this one is with noise and this is uh, without noise and then used uh, this uh, AI application of deep learning to remove that noise. Now to our eyes, you may not be able to even notice that the third seven and the first seven, there is any difference. The difference is very small. So the in the third one, the noise that we see in the second picture has been removed and it looks much more clear. Similarly, like uh, these applications can be used for uh, like if there's a picture, uh, very old picture and you want to like recover, uh, maybe there's a fold and some sort of like line appears. So how you can remove the line or if somebody has taken a picture like uh, you must have seen uh, 
even I think in uh, news media it was there. In India, there were some wrestlers who were arrested, and they were take being taken somewhere, and then there were two pictures, two, some pictures appeared, which showed them smiling as if they are very happy, and uh, very quickly it, people were able to find that it was like a fake image, and AI was used to insert a smile. So these are the kind of methods uh, that actually, if somebody's eyes are closed, for example, and the only picture you have is that, how you can recover that, like you can uh, use AI to open the eyes, you can add a smile, you can change few uh, features and make the person look better. So a lot of applications. So when we are working with like this kind of unstructured data, like image data, so uh, obviously this machine learning, deep learning methods, uh, although everybody knows that we use unstructured data there, but they need the data input to be structured still. Uh, they don't straight away work with unstructured data. They need data to be first converted into some kind of rows and columns. So, and uh, that's what like pre-processing is like where uh, people have to work on preparing the data before it can uh, generate models for prediction. So for example, this uh, image of handwritten five, when it is converted based on the pixels and all that, uh, you see, it looks like five. So zero is like where it is black and the highest value is 255 where it is white and the rest of the numbers are in between, but even that looks somewhat like five after converting this unstructured image data to structured data. Another application is uh, language processing, natural language processing, uh, things like chat GPT, uh, which uh, requires lots and lots of data. It is trained on huge amount of data. So, so this, is a, uh, this, is a, uh, this is from one of my researches, medical speech and response, a response is common symptoms. And the method we use is LSTM. Uh, it's a deep learning network, a type of deep learning network uh, that helps, uh, especially in those situations where uh, you are trying to figure out some meaning in data where the two words may be separated by a long distance. And some of the deep learning methods, they start to have difficulties, but LSTM uh, is able to retain even long-term relationships. So, Sentence one is like, I like to eat chocolates. So this like and chocolate, they are close to each other. But in the second sentence, like and chocolate is separated by a big distance. And many deep learning methods struggle there. But LSTM has become very popular when working with NLP, natural language processing. And then we have a deep learning applications in fashion, uh, obviously, if you have a system that can recognize and it could have a lot of applications, uh, you can choose something and then you can, you don't have to go to a trial room and change your dress and then come and see how it looks. You can do it immediately, but you need a deep learning model to correctly classify those items. So we used the uh, MNIST uh, fashion data, which is a very popular uh, with the deep learning community, machine learning community. It has uh, 60,000 images, and I have used 10,000 images for testing the model. So different kinds of items. Uh, so we label them as like zero, one up to nine, depending on whether it's a t-shirt or a coat or a shirt or a bag. And then uh, the gold standard for this kind of application is CNN, convolutional neural network, which again has uh, different layers. I have only shown like there's an input and then there are some layers, pooling layer, uh, dropout layer and etc. But the layers could be very, very deep. Uh, why we use this? I have done a very simple calculation just to highlight. So if you have a fully connected network where you have neurons, and 
your image is 28 by 28 and we are not talking about color images just black and white so 28 by 28 by 1 so number of uh, input neurons will be 784 simply 28 by 28 and if you go to the first layer where we do certain things to basically develop the model you end up with 21600 and then that itself gives you more than 16 million plus neurons to work with. So your network becomes very, very big. But if you are using a convolutional network, because the way it is designed, you only end up with 320. So drastic reduction from something which is like 16 million plus to only 360. So obviously like even with the, all the technology that we have today, uh, training models with a lot of neurons or a lot of parameters is a time-consuming consuming process. I remember like uh, when I was running uh, one of the models, I had to leave my laptop for almost a week and allow it to run before I got my first model, which was not good. And then I had to think how to run it again. So very time-consuming process. So we, when you bring down the number of parameters, that will save a lot of time. And then obviously uh, we generate a confusion matrix and calculate how accurate, good or bad your model is. So like uh, if you see misclassification on the off diagonal, for example, six and zero, you see a lot of uh, cases of misclassification, 456. Now, if you go back and see what is six and zero, so shirt and t-shirt. So the Deep learning model is getting confused between some t-shirt and shirts because they look similar. So we got uh, the point I want to highlight is 94% uh, with training and 92% with testing data. That's not bad. And then uh, we try to generalize it, like bring some sandals, t-shirt, which was not in the data set, MNIST data set, but bring it and take some pictures from uh, a retailer. And suddenly we find that we were getting 90 plus and now it drops to 50%. And we were wondering what happened. And then we found actually it was a very small thing. It was a very small thing. In MNIST data, if you look at shoes, every time you look at shoes, uh, toes are pointing in one direction. But when we would try to generalize it, we use some pictures where toes were pointing in different direction. So just one example. And then we had to actually uh, create the model in such a way that whether it is left or right, it should not matter. And then we were able to increase the accuracy. So uh, this is a very typical problem in deep learning or AI applications. You may have heard of uh, uh, research where somebody was trying to develop a model to predict a race of a person. And the only problem was that uh, most of the white people were used in that and the data set, input data did not have like uh, many people from other community. And uh, when somebody with a different color skin was used and uh, they tried to make the prediction, it says it's gorilla. It's not even human being, it's a gorilla. So. That kind of problem occurs if your data is not representative. Another applications of application of deep learning is transfer learning. Like just like a teacher transfers the learning they have accumulated over years and decades and go to a class and try to transfer that knowledge to students. Similarly, in uh, deep learning, there is a method called transfer learning where you don't have to start from the scratch. So if somebody already developed a very sophisticated a deep learning model and they have optimized the parameters, why not use that and plug it to some layers that need your data and then work with that. So ResNet50 is a very popular network with the more than 50 layers. It has pre-trained weights and it is based on millions of images. And the total number of parameters it has is more than 25 million. And it can classify images into 1,000 different categories. 
so when we already have that why not like uh, reuse and see what happens if we are doing something with images so very interesting like if you take a picture of a dog and just uh, without any model just use this network it can tell you this is you can think of score something like a probability so 76% chance that this dog is norwich terrier so i know like this is a norwich terrier and the model is able to predict very accurately and then 12% uh, chance of it could be norfolk or australian and then the probability so it gives you a big list actually it will give a probability up to 10 20 30 whatever you like but key thing is like big difference between the two here if there are like a big probabilities at the top there could be some confusion but in this case there is no such confusion another popular deep learning uh, network is a uh, generative network and uh, there was a article actually i read this in 2018 so there was this picture which sold for 430 like almost half a million dollar uh the important thing or key point is that this image was not drawn by a human it was drawn by a deep learning model and it sold for almost like half a billion half a million dollars so the key thing about uh, these uh, generative networks is that it can generate something new and how it does is uh, very simple so there is a network your generator generator network where you are trying to optimize all the parameters uh so noise is fed to that and it will generate a fake image and then you also have a real image and there is a some kind of police who says that this is fake this is real so it will predict a class now suppose it is a image of a dog real image and this one tries to imitate something and it doesn't look like so it will fail and the idea is to reach a situation where even the fake images it becomes difficult to uh, differentiate so just as an example these are all the 500 digits by somebody uh, which are all the real images that were fed to the network and then it started with noise like this is after 100 iterations each picture is after 100 iterations so first one you can see is total noise so very easily it will separate them and it continues like that and then slowly after failing a lot of times it starts to make that image of five so some people would say like uh, uh if i put my name in, let's say in chat gpt or uh, tell me about uh, bharatendra rai or tell me about this guy and it says i don't know this person but if you force it will generate something which may look real but actually it is not real i know that this is not me so uh, some some people wonder why it doesn't give you correct answer it is not designed for that it always uh, it, it is designed for like fake or creating something that doesn't exist whether it is image uh, with imagenet kind of uh, data sets or chat gpt where it uses a lot of like text data so it is not there to give you correct answers it is there to generate something new so probably uh, five more minutes then i stop okay. so this is application uh, dl applications in self driving uh, i think you all, we all know uh, elon musk of tesla he wants to convert all the cars that can drive themselves and uh, the plan is like the future design will not have a steering wheel actually uh, you sit in a car and just go and the reason behind or application case behind that is uh, as per elon musk uh, we don't use our cars much if you see uh, during a week a number of hours you, we use our cars sometimes it is like even less than 10 i i calculated how many uh, how long i drew my car last week it was just 6 hours not more than that and rest of the time it is just sitting idle so this uh, traffic congestion and all that 
pollution, all those things can be solved if a person wants to go from place A to place B. And if uh, that service is available within few seconds, then there won't be any need for the car. But then it has to do a lot of like, uh, it has to understand many things. So if it sees, a, sees something in the, using the camera uh, that this is a person, and especially like uh, obviously deep learning model also depend on the context. So if it is a retail shop and if, if the camera looks at somebody, uh, which could be like uh, not a real person, but maybe a picture, uh, but if it, it is on the road, obviously based on the context, uh, the chances are higher that it is a real, a real person and then brakes are to be applied and things like that. But it's a complex problem, especially because uh, different countries have different way people behave on roads. So this is a popular application. Uh, another application of deep learning is uh, language translation. So we are, we are all familiar with that. Uh, speech recognition, whether it's, you have Alexa or Siri, it can recognize. If you look at applications uh, in research, you'll see a lot of like increase in number of papers. Uh, so this is a number of paper counts uh, in PubMed. So in medical science also, like you can see deep learning is going up very quickly. Machine learning has been going up of late. So this is my book on advanced deep learning. So one uh, interesting quote by Kasparov after he lost to com computer in 1999 is at least it cannot enjoy the win. So that was his statement after losing. So I will probably skip big data part. So these are the things we do in a single minute nowadays, a lot of data getting generated. Uh, half a million tweets in one minute. TikTok videos, 167 million. So huge amounts of data are getting generated. So this is a IBM uh, room where you have a supercomputer. There are two scientists who are operating this. This is 1960 mainframe computer. And in 2023, uh, this is a screenshot of my phone. And uh, this is like million times more powerful than what we had in 1960. So we have come a long way. And that's, a, that's one of the things, technology that is driving this AI. Thing. In business, there are a lot of examples. I gave example of like how uh, Amazon studies uh, your face and does a lot of experiments. Where are we looking? What, how our sentiments are, how our face changes when we focus on something. And uh, retailers are beginning to do that also. Like retail next, you may not have heard of it, but it has customer set of 60 retail chains. They collect 10,000 data points per store visitor. Collect more than 75 petabytes of data. They uh, cover more than 400 million shopping trips per year. And they use more than 30,000 sensors across thousands of stores in more than 50 retail chains in 20 countries. And the process raw data into trillions of analytical data points, like somebody entering a store, whether they turn left or they turn right. And they, when they go in some area where their eyes are, what they are looking at, how much time they stand, how much time they walk. So all that data are getting collected. Again, this is a very popular uh, Venn diagram where you need all kinds of skills. So just computer skill, hacking skill uh, is basically computer skills is not enough nowadays. And if you are even a subject matter expert, that's not enough. That's still a danger still. Mathematics and statistics knowledge is very important uh, to see like what is significant, what is not, what is important, what is not. I have a YouTube channel and uh, I have also like made a list of top 10 must know machine learning methods. So anybody who is like starting the journey, what are the methods uh, that, that is like 
that should be on their list. So if you are interested, you can visit that. Uh, my YouTube is at BK Rai. So with that, I'm going to stop. And uh, I will, I'd like to thank everyone for very patient listening. Let me know if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, doctor, I have questions, two questions. So one, one is that uh, I use this machine learning method to predict uh, a structure of protein. So I published that paper in uh, ACS General. Uh, in that, what I use that I uh, collected some biochemical data using a small angle X-ray scattering. And then I put that data. Uh, uh, in fact, I, I um, uh, did uh, some molecular dynamic simulation first. And then I tried to compare the biochemical data. And I tried to fit that biochemical data based on uh, the molecular dynamic simulation. And in that, uh, uh, after getting the sum of structure, I put uh, machine learning method, I use machine learning method uh, in which I put some kind of weightage to different kinds of structures. And I did several iterations. And after that, I got uh, very interesting data. Normally, people think that the protein structure is very constant or single structure. But when I did that, then I found that uh, it's not a single structure. It's a co uh, combination of four or five different structure at the uh, low energy level. So um, I, I was wondering that uh, there, there are some AI-based program uh, in which we can predict the protein structures. Uh, uh, so those program are mainly based on uh, only um, uh, uh, only just a machine learning method or they are uh, based on combination of machine learning as well as the biochemical data do you do you know that uh, means can you please, please comment on that yeah let me uh, uh, a There are a lot of like uh, very interesting uh, open source resources. Uh, like I think Bioconductor, I don't know if you have come across that. Uh, alpha Folding, I think Alpha Folding uh, is some kind of thing. Yeah, have you come across Bioconductor? No. It's a very, uh, very well known, I think, among uh, the community. And uh, the good thing is like whether you use Python or R, like those are the two leading ones. I use R a lot, uh, but both of them, I, I know in R, Bioconductor has a huge, uh, like they created a lo lot of like uh, uh, applications, a lot of examples, and uh, they have a very detailed website uh, with the, uh, and th those are the people who are expert in that area. So it, it's developed by the experts. So I'm sure, like, if you visit that, you will, you'll get some uh, okay. good information there. Okay. And second question is related to medical. How how accurate is the prediction based on AI about the medical uh, conditions? Uh, because I I I was thinking that the medical field is going towards more on personalized care or personalized medicine. So in that case, AI would be helpful. Uh, how it will be helpful uh, in predicting uh, personal care or personal medicine or personal treatment? Yeah. Uh, actually, I attended a conference. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of the company. It's actually called the Google of uh, Healthcare. And what they do is uh, they have like uh, created a repository of hu like huge database of all the medical or healthcare related literature. And uh, uh, 
there one is like somebody can search very quickly within that and get relevant information quickly but going a step ahead like uh, let's say a doctor is working on something important and they have a very very specific case and they put in some information just like what you do in chat gpt uh, put a prompt uh, but that prompt have, has to be obviously accurate uh, th there are now <laughs> uh chat gpt is not very old but i see like uh, uh, people from stanford and others like they are not teaching a course on prompt design how to design a prompt so uh, but it's very valid that uh, you have to really be very careful like what prompt you are giving otherwise you can waste a lot of time but with the proper uh, prompt you can get like uh, good quality information uh, because it has uh, the key thing is it has a repository of like uh, all the knowledge that has been like <laughs> generated uh, in uh, decades and maybe sometimes uh, centuries so uh, just like when there is a problem we go to a friend and try to see what you did or another friend or take some uh, other opinion but now with on a fingertip like uh, people especially like somebody expert can quickly have that access so it can help a lot in that sense uh, yeah but i i think uh, uh, human human body is very complex means trillions of cells and trillions of uh, uh, reactions uh, in that and then every cells is di behaving differently and they are in different phases not not on a, on, on one single phase i remember that there is 2015 uh, kobe research institute in japan they use the most powerful supercomputer to simulate the one second of brain activity and it took uh, uh, um, uh, they they generated about 15 petabytes of data uh, by just doing one uh, second data and that took almost 30 minutes to create one second of data mm. sorry 30 hours to create one second of data so that's that's the huge thing yeah i think uh, you're right uh, like the way we look at a image and we can say this is cat this is dog or uh, uh, the models uh, they need uh, sometimes uh, they uh, misclassify also so we are not at a stage where uh, we can get rid of doctors i would say <laughs> doctors are still important and they are needed so uh, but we are a, we are at a stage where uh, they can get that help quick or information getting the correct information quickly which is uh, in many cases like could be a life saver uh, so at least we are at that stage we are not at a stage where we can do away with the doctor and then with ai uh, a robot comes to the room and uh, takes over the patient so we are not still uh, at that stage and how how uh, accurate ai is now on predicting the uh, age based on face yeah i think uh, if you look at facebook or google uh, they are pretty close actually like they are able to bring uh, two pictures like that you have not classified yet or named yet and one may be from your childhood one may be from your current age and it will ask you a question are the these same people sometimes it may make a mistake that it brings your picture and your brother's old picture and ask whether these are same people or not but at least it is asking uh, that means uh, it, it has some doubt but uh, when you say yes or no very soon it will start to generate like uh, without you telling uh, it will it will be able to tell you like almost like accurately but uh, face detection is very very accurate i would say like uh, look at iphone uh, you cannot open iphone with the picture or somebody else uh, you need you yeah but, but uh, face detection is okay but the face detection with the age because we were trying to do some experiment to uh, uh, detect the age of the person based on the wrinkles and yeah. uh, as uh, it its accuracy starts 
better when we around 30 to 40, 20 to 40 years the accuracy is better and when we go on uh, means when we are getting older then the accuracy is reducing in that yeah i think uh, you are right that's a difficult question uh, difficult problem to solve i think even for ai because like somebody who has a black hair whether it is dye or not first it has to detect that whether it is a real color or uh, artificial color so yeah uh, wrinkle especially uh, so those things are definitely important okay thank you thank you any other questions uh, yes sir uh, thanks uh, dr rai for the nice talk i learned a lot so nowadays uh, people raising concern about the use of ai regarding the risk factor so what are the risk factor using ai will ai go going to rule on human in the future i think that that's a debate uh, people are actually beginning to have and there are very interesting books now uh, on singularity where like it takes over the humans and uh, starts to do things uh, that we never plan to do uh, but that uh, risk is there like uh, i always give example in my class that uh, that risk is with every technology not just ai look at like technology like knife so uh, people made knife to cut vegetables and fruits but if somebody uh, misuses it to kill somebody you cannot blame the knife that it is bad so ai also like uh, can do both things like self driving cars who knows somebody misuses it and programs it as a some kind of killer of uh, it gives a picture and it goes and kills somebody so uh, who knows like uh, how people are going to use that but definitely uh, it has risk uh, i remember example where uh, us was like about to press the nu uh, nuclear button uh, because they saw like uh, some missiles coming from russia towards us and uh, their model predicted that uh, this is coming and uh, then somebody realized that uh, it is not really a missile it's because of the lights in certain way it it seemed like a missile so it was actually a misclassification by the model that it was not a missile but the lights uh, like working in some way and it looked like a missile so who knows like uh, if that person did not intervene uh, there could have been a nuclear disaster so if if it is left to like uh, ai yeah uh, that can happen because we are not at a stage where they can make sometimes they can make a mistake but uh, some people predict like by 2040 maybe in our lifetime singularity will be there who knows uh, i don't know if you watch uh, there is a on netflix there is a series black mirror some some of you might have seen that so uh, it it highlights a lot of dangers of ai things uh, things that can go wrong so like a metal what's that like a terminator terminator you can only do robot <laughs> anyone else who have questions with dr rai Uh, another question is that, uh, you know, our, uh, in, in basically in human genome have only four letters, A, T, and G, C, and there are multiple combinations. So can we use AI to predict the, the future human by using the genomic data? And for that, how much data we need? How much human genome sequence we need? do we need? Yeah, actually, uh, I have not... Uh... Uh, I have done some very basic analysis at this stage, applied like uh, methods like principal component analysis for analyzing uh, genome data. Uh, but uh, I have not been at that stage where I can say like specifically like how much data. But one thing is true, like it depends on uh, the model you are using. If you are using like deep learning methods, uh, it uh, definitely requires lots and lots of data. 
uh, you cannot work with small data when you are using like deep learning methods. And uh, but in deep learning, there is also a way to actually uh, that that simple example I was giving uh, of uh, toes pointing in one direction, uh, but in the deep learning itself, uh, there are methods that can actually uh, generate more data based on the basic data and provide like a uh, lot of different uh, alternations or simulated kind of data and artificially increase the data size because you mm -hmm. need a lot of data if you are applying deep learning. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Roy. I am Dr. Alok Divedi. I have my own query with you. You just started uh, your lecture from social media accounts and all. I today in afternoon in India, I followed you on Twitter account and saw your first retweet, the latest retweet. Uh, I think you have just remembered. Uh, India is the land of civilization, culture, and values. How AI will deal it and how this India in uh, uh, with having civilization, culture, and values will deal with AI. Bharat ki awaj jivit rahe, surakchit rahe. Aap isme AI ki kaisi bhumi ka dekhte? Yeah, so I think... Uh... Uh, one thing that is likely to come, uh, and uh, maybe we'll see even in US, uh, if you recall when Trump won the election uh, previous time, uh, they, they made use of social media a lot. And uh, that's the time when uh, nobody had heard of like the fake news and those kind of uh, fake stories were getting planted in Facebook. And uh, I'm sure I re remember there was a Boston-based company, Cambridge Analytica, uh, which came under investigation for uh, trying to influence the outcome of an election using AI and social media especially. So that was like almost eight years back. And uh, now, if you look at uh, India is going to face a major election in 24, and uh, probably use of technology in making people believe uh, what some some political uh, group believes that this is right, or uh, like even like attempting to uh, project as if uh, the wrestlers were smiling, they were very happy uh, going with the police. So uh, my guess is that uh, those kind of things will happen at a, a big, much bigger scale. Uh, in the next election, and uh, it is for the audience uh, or as a hu human being whether we have to be very careful like what we believe, what is real and what is unreal. So that difference, unless somebody sees from their own eyes, uh, that difference uh, is going to be become very very difficult because we are used to watching TV and watching like on social media and videos. And you will see something and you will feel that, oh, this person is saying this. And reality may be that that's AI. Uh, somebody is just programmed. Uh, I'm sure you must have seen like uh, Ob Obama's, uh, uh, Obama's like video, uh, even introducing a very small class uh, at a small university. And you and I can make that kind of video. Uh, it's not that difficult where it will feel like that Obama is introducing you to the class. So welcome to the class of Dr. Alok, and uh, he's going to teach this, this is in this semester, he will give you four homeworks, there will be five exams. And so Obama telling like very authentically, like you cannot even uh, detect uh, that this is not Obama. So I think that's going to be a big challenge and uh, the problem, the biggest problem, I think uh, many conferences they highlight is uh, where AI is and where the government is with the regulations, the gap is very, very huge. And most of the times uh, people there don't even understand where we are heading. So a uh, lot, uh, lot of things are going to happen, I think, uh, 
one has to be <laughs> really careful. I think I will leave it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lekin abhi is baat ko aur aage badhana. To main personally aap se main ispe discuss karunga. Amit sir, kuch kahan ja rahe hain hamare panel mein hai. नहीं मैंने तो ऐसे पहले ही पूछ लिया है मेरा शायद डॉक्टर राय ने उत्तर दे भी दिया कि भाई उसमें रैंडमनेस कैसे आती है कि भाई या तो हम कोई सीड जनरेट कर रहे हैं उससे मतलब रैंडम सीड जनरेट को जनरेटर बोलते हैं तो मैं उन्होंने जवाब दे दिया तो ये सब भाई मिलिट्री टेक्नोलॉजी का अप्लीकेशन है अब हाउस एवर यू मै स्लाइस इट और डाइस इट बट दैट्स वॉट इट इज भाई मिलिट्री में काम है तो उसका एक छोटा हिस्सा ए में हम लोगों को दिखाया जा रहा है बस मैं ये बोलना चाह रहा था मेरा काम हो गया आपने बहुत बढ़िया लेक्चर दिया और कई चीजें मुझे नई पता चली बस ये बोलना चाहता हूँ धन्यवाद थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच डॉक्टर भारती ऑल द ऑडियंस और पुनः के एस ए एस टॉक पर एक नए व्याख्यान माला के साथ हम लोग उपस्थित होंगे अगले महीने और उसकी सूचना आपको ईमेल इत्यादि माध्यमों से दे दी जाएगी डॉक्टर भारतेंद्र राय को पूर्वोम स्कूल ऑफ एडवांस साइंसेज स्कूल ऑफ इंडिया के स्टडीज इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ एडवांस साइंसेज की तरफ से बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद बहुत बहुत आभार आपका ये वार्ता और जो एक प्रश्न है जो भारत की संस्कृति या किसी भी देश की संस्कृति सभ्यता मानवीय मूल्यों को के साथ को कितने अस्थायी रूप से बदलने की आवश्यकता है और ए के युग में कितनी तीव्रता के साथ ये बदल रहा है ये बीच का जो अंतर्द्वंद है इस अंतर्द्वंद के साथ जो समस्याएं हमारे सामने आएंगी उन समस्याओं के समाधान हेतु तो डॉक्टर भारतेंद्र राय सरीखे विद्वान हमारे बीच में उपस्थित होंगे और उन विद्वानों के माध्यम से दी गई जो हमारे समाधान है उसी को समाज में संप्रेषित कर हम इस समस्याओं का समाधान पा सकते हैं और एक सुस्थिर समाज की स्थापना और उस समाज को आगे गतिशील रखना जो पूर्वोम स्कूल ऑफ एडवांस साइंसेस इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ एडवांस साइंसेस स्कूल ऑफ इंडिक स्टडीज का सम्मिलित प्रयास है ऐसी व्यवस्था बन सके आप सबका बहुत बहुत आभार बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू